So great, let's let's get started. We've given a minute more for those of you who are just joining in. Uh, so today, day two of uh, the sequence of our optimization series, uh, we're going to again focus on one topic today. What we did in the last session was the connectivity. We understood how we could actually uh, ensure we are uh, saving some amount of time while we are basically configuring the network uh, protocols that has to be used by SQL Server. Uh, today, we'll work with something similar. We're going to now focus a little bit on uh, what are the simple configurations that you can actually do uh, in order to uh, make the database perform better at the instance level? Uh, there are quite a few things which we can do at the instance level, but a lot of them are related to a query. So as we start covering queries, uh, we will cover each of those uh, topics, but at least the ones which are not related to queries is what we'll cover in today's step. Uh, so I'm going to basically open a whiteboard like yesterday and share my screen. Let me know once it's visible. So I've just shared a Microsoft whiteboard. Let me know if uh, it's visible to you. Excellent. Uh, so today we're going to uh, discuss a couple of topics on the SQL Server itself. Now, uh, we've understood the communication, we understood the connectivity yesterday, uh, and today we are going to discuss the server. Now, when we talk about the SQL Server, uh, let me know in case the whiteboard is not visible. I'm assuming it is, but in case it's not visible, just let me know. Okay, so we are going to talk today about the server. Now, the server is usually your physical box on which you are installing SQL Server. At least that's what we will refer to as the server. But to be honest, from the aspect of SQL Server, there is no concept of server as such. What we talk about is an instance. Uh, the whiteboard is not visible. Uh, you're not able to see the whiteboard? Okay, I was sharing that whiteboard in Teams. Maybe that's the problem. Let me just share my desktop. Give me a second. Is it visible now? Yes. Okay. Okay. So when we talk about a server, SQL Server, usually we use the word server. So I'm going to write server here. We normally are referring to a box. Okay, that's usually the word when we say server. So it's most probably a server, which is a Windows Server machine uh, with Windows Server installed on it. When you set up SQL Server on this, what you set up is not really called a server. Now that sounds very English complicated because the product is called SQL Server. But when you're installing SQL Server, you're not really installing a server. What you will be installing is called an instance. And you can install multiple instances of SQL Server on the same box. So whenever you connect to SQL Server, although we might usually use the English where we say we are connecting to a SQL Server, we are normally connecting to an instance of SQL Server. Maybe there's only one instance of SQL Server. Maybe there are multiple instances of SQL Server. If there's only one instance of SQL Server, usually the name of the machine, the name of the server, and the name of the instance will be the same in terms of the connectivity. The minute you install the second instance of SQL Server, then that would change because now you'll have to give the instance a name because now you need to be able to differentiate from instance one and instance two. Then you will need to use your server name slash instance name in order to basically connect to a server, a SQL Server instance. Otherwise, by default, you just use the server name or you use the IP and you're actually connecting to the default instance of SQL Server. So in simple, what I'm trying to tell you is with SQL Server, there is no concept of a server as such. There's a concept of an instance. So every time you're connecting to SQL Server, you are connecting to an instance of SQL Server. 
what is an instance made about it's an independent so why create two instances is as good as saying you basically install two separate servers all together the couple of components of course which are shared but i'm not going to go into that because that's more for the administrators i know i'm addressing a lot of the developer crowd you're looking at how you want to basically optimize your queries so i'm going to keep i'm going to stay away from those discussions and we're going to simply talk about uh, the instance itself and what is an instance made up of now an instance is made up of certain databases which are normally referred to as system databases again not going into depth into this but again you have all seen these databases you'll see a database called master you'll see a database called msdb you'll see a database called tempdb and you'll see a database called modeldb these are the databases that's visible to you there's a fifth database that's hidden but is a very integral part of your instance uh, starting from sql server 2005 onwards and that is what we refer to as the resource db this is a little different from the rest because this is not visible to you this this is a hidden database but the database very much exists which makes up your instance of sql server so when you create because these are all independent units so when you create a user or to log into sql server or when you create a login for sql server you are creating it on an instance there is no such thing where i create one login and you can connect to all the instances not possible every instance is independent of each other and comes with its own set of system databases as you see here in in this reference okay. again not going into the details of what is master what is msdb what is tempdb what is modeldb what is resource db that's for another training which we most probably will talk in administration today i'm going to focus on the optimization and the performance part of this and going to tell you the one database for you as a developer for your queries which is going to be very very important is this database called the temp db because every operation that you basically run no matter how good your query is no matter how bad your query is whether you optimized it not optimized it the temp db plays a very integral part in the performance of your query now the temp db what is the role it plays now the role it plays here is very simple it basically plays that role of being that store for any kind of temporary operation or temporary storage your system might require so while you're running a query and you're trying to do a join and the system needs to pick data up store it uh, temporarily to basically maybe compare it for the join or when you're trying to do an order by or sort data or when you're trying to basically do a filter or a sub select or a sub query and any time your query needs temporary storage it needs a place to store this uh, temporary data and this is stored in the temp db including your hash tables a lot of people basically mistake temp db and think only hash tables are stored here um, uh, it's it's wrong temp db is not only for hash tables or temp tables temp db is for every temporary object every temporary a uh, storage that the system requires a uh, temp db is used even uh, your table variable if you are using in your programming if you basically created a stored procedure used a table variable the table variable is also created and stored in temp db it becomes an object in temp db now sql server when it needs to temporarily store data although you are not creating a temp variable a uh, table variable or a, a temp table uh, and it needs to store data it creates what is called work tables and these work tables are also stored in the temp db now the first thing you need to understand as a developer here is uh, the importance in terms of uh, the way sql server is architected now the way this product is architected the first issue that you're going to have is every instance of sql server has only one temp db right you might have uh, 50 databases 50 user databases you might have 20 user databases you might have 150 user databases so you might have plenty of user databases but the number of temp dbs per instance is equal to only one which means your query is running on 50 databases when they need to basically store temporary data they will be using only one database and that's the temp db and what i'm referring to right now is straight away a performance a big question mark on performance because now you're creating a single dependency you're creating one single system which could actually be slowing down all your queries that you are basically working on and you don't even know that uh, the the gut culprit for all your queries slowing down is actually your temp db so a very important part for you to basically analyze even before you start basically breaking your head about you being a bad developer you coding wrongly uh before you even go into all of that stuff it's always good to check these preliminaries to find out whether um, 
uh, it's not your query, but something else that is actually causing you the problem, especially when you have a lot of concurrent queries running across multiple databases. Uh, you might start seeing a performance bottleneck, and that performance bottleneck might be simply you're overloading the temp team. In fact, uh, most often I've told uh, developers that one of the things that you need to do as a developer when you're working is avoid the usage of hash tables and temporary tables. See whether you can basically do this without those hash tables and temporary tables. Uh, this uh, in itself is not going to solve your problem because even without you creating hash tables or uh, table variables, SQL Server will still may most probably want to create work tables to temporary store data and tempdb is still used. Asking developers to avoid the use of hash tables is more uh, saying that um, tempdb is already going to be a bottleneck. We all know that. Uh, here's your system databases. Here's your tempdb. We all know that tempdb is going to be a bottleneck. So why uh, burden it further by avoiding uh, our, our, uh, our codes, our programs uh, to create temp objects? We'll be ensuring we reduce that particular stress on uh, tempdb. Uh, and uh, quite a few times you might be able to refactor your queries, not using hash, not using temp uh, tables, and you most probably will be able to um, just use intelligent programming, uh, code things a little more complicatedly, spend a little more time on your code, and maybe you will be able to basically avoid uh, the need to temporarily store data. Uh, because uh, a lot of times when we do code reviews, what we do understand is a lot of hash tables are created, and they're not created because of the need to temporarily store data. Uh, they've been created more in the need to simplify the program, uh, where you do step one, you store it into a temp storage, then you read it again, and then you uh, do some more operations on it in step two. Uh, in this way, what happens is you simplify uh, the programming logic, and it's more visible to the developer than actually a need. So this maybe you should avoid. Let the developer take the complexities and see how we can basically do all his operations without needing to stage the data in between. Uh, of course, there are also genuine uh, times where you know the business logic says that you need to store data temporarily and there's no option. Uh, in those cases, it's good and a valid use of uh, hash tables or table variables, uh, and, and you can more or less use it. Another thing which I would like to most probably discuss today, which is a question which a lot of developers uh, frequently uh, talk about. Now, when you are forced to firstly avoid the use of temporary staging data within a program execution, that would be my first advice and the best advice you could most probably get. The second thing is now assuming that you have to temporarily store data. You have to stage this data and there is no option out of this. Uh, and you've decided that uh, you've tried everything and you say, well, so I don't have an option. I need to store data. There are two options. One, you can use a table variable. And most developers out there understand what I'm talking about. You can use a table variable. Or two, you can also use a single hash or a double hash table, which are normally called temp tables in SQL. So those are your two options. Now, the often asked question is, when can I use the table variable? And when can I use the hash table? Now, what we have again noticed in our code reviews is, a lot of people use this, lots of usage. Wherever temporary data has to be stored, we see people using these hash tables very frequently. So this is something that we've already noticed and seen as a pattern. Now, here's the difference if you're looking at it technically. When you create a hash table, either a single hash or a double hash, uh, I'm hoping you know the difference between those two. If you don't, please, please do ping me on the chat and I'll uh, spend some time explaining it. I don't want to waste your time if you already know. Now, if you're creating a hash table, the good thing about it is it's created as a normal object, as a normal table in tempdb. When I say it's created as a normal table, it's created just like any other user table that you create. The only difference is it's not created in the database that you're trying to create it in. It's created in the tempdb database that we, are, we keep talking about. Otherwise, these hash tables are just normal objects. They basically have the same structures, which you will basically understand as we progress through these series of sessions. You will have statistics on them. You can build indexes on them. You create primary keys on them. You can create constraints on them. In other words, you can treat it just like a normal table. Uh, with differences, of course, is the life of this table is as long as the session that created it exists. So when you make a connection and you create an hash table, the life of this table is going to be only for the time that connection exists. When you disconnect, uh, this, the, this connection will be dropped. Uh, the table will be dropped. 
And secondly, this is not created in your user database. This is created in the temp DB database. That's as far as hash tables are concerned. Now the table variable on the other side, when we talk about this, this is also created as a normal object, okay? In your temp DB, this is also created in temp DB. Very important to understand that because a lot of people, at least that's a, my favorite interview question. I ask people the difference between table variables and table uh, hash tables. And usually they say one is in memory and one is in temp DB. That's the wrong answer. That's the wrong perception. Both are basically stored in the temp DB. So that's a very important part. What's the difference? Now, the difference is since this is a variable, it's basically treated as a container. It is not treated as an object. And because this is treated as a container, it's treated as a variable, which is nothing but a container. Uh, it's more of an array type. So when we talk about a table variable, it's a container which basically works like an array. Because of this, you will not be able to do the normal table operations on it. So there is no stats. There is no indexes. And there is no constraints. So you will not be able to do any of the regular table operations on this because this is now a variable of an array type, which is a container. Uh, although the storage happens in tempdb, the object references in tempdb, you will not be able to do those regular uh, table operations on it. Now this in itself should give the developers out there an idea when to use the table variable and when to use an hash table. Now, if your records, if you ask me for a thumb rule here, I will tell you if the number of rows of data that you're going to be storing in you know, temporarily is less than 5,000, please use the table variable because there is no point of creating indexes and stats and all of that stuff is of no use because the table itself is small. However, if the temporary storage, your data you're storing is more than 5,000, then please go ahead and create an hash table. And again, uh, the small little tip would basically help you improve performance. If you, if, you, if you go into your system, which is most likely, and you see a lot of hash tables, and you see the number of rows you're storing them is 15 and 20 and 30 and 50, uh, you will definitely see a performance difference if you convert all of them uh, to table variables. But of course, uh, please don't forget the original advice. The better thing to do would be to ensure that you do not basically use temporary storage at all and you try and see whether you can refactor your entire program or without using temporary storage and you can basically do all, everything that you want uh, using a comp complex set of programs that you're building uh, rather than trying to temporarily stage data uh, in, in any of the options, either table variables or uh, hash tables. So that's uh, one tip which we give out to developers there. And secondly is, now, since the stem DB, irrelevant to whether you create table variables or you create hash tables, uh, they are going to be uh, a heavily used database. In fact, the temp DB, I always say, is the most happening database uh, that you basically have on your instance. It's forever in operations. It's read operations, write operations, because uh, uh, a lot of stuff happens there, and none of the stuff are permanent. Okay, so even if work tables are created uh, by your execution plan, uh, because it feels the need to stage data for an operation. Uh, you will see that work table is dropped as soon as the execution is complete. So there's going to be a lot of deletes, a lot of writes, a lot of drops, a lot of dynamic activity happening in the system. So what I would recommend strongly, because uh, assuming that today you're doing the logically right thing, and you have the SQL Server uh, instance for you of yours running on an Azure virtual machine or an SQL platform, uh, if it's a platform, then Microsoft is taking care of this for you. You don't have to worry. But if it's a SQL Server VM that you're using, then you need to basically ensure that you basically give the best possible performance storage options for TempDB. And in an Azure VM, the best place to store your TempDB to give it the best options, which has not been done in this machine, but you can always check here and ask your administrators, is to use the D drive. And no, sorry, I was wrong. Okay. In my system currently, you notice the tempdb's data files, the data file, which is the MDF file, okay, and the tempdb's log file, which is the LDF file, both are basically stored on a temporary storage D. Now, why this basically is a good thing to do is because on an Azure VM, your temporary storage D is uncharged for Microsoft does not charge you for this drive. But of course, you've got a data loss warning here on the D drive at all times, which is good to read. It says there is uh, this is a temporary disk. Any data stored on this disk is subject to loss, and there is no way to recover it. So Microsoft tells you that this file is there on every D drive on an Azure VM. 
in spite of that, I'm telling you, store tempdb's data file and uh, all their files, data files, LDF files on this drive. Because to be honest, tempdb stores nothing permanently. So in case you lose it, no problems. Okay, so it's it's fine to basically store the tempdb data files and log files here. And why will this improve performance? This will improve performance because on most Azure VMs, the D drive is a solid state drive. Even if you are using an HDD storage, uh, and you picked up your OS disk and your dead data disks are all HDD storage, standard storage. The temp drives that are offered by most of the modern series of Azure VMs is a solid state drive. So that's the first benefit that you get. You get SSD storage. The second benefit, which is much more important to basically understand is this D drive is basically coming from your host machine. It is not from the network storage. Your OS disk, your data disks, everything that you add are coming from a network storage. It's coming from SAN which means in order to access these disks, you need to move across the network. However, the D drive is basically picked up from the local machine, from the host machine on which this VM is running. An Azure machine is a virtual machine, just like any other uh, uh, provided to you. And this virtual machine is created on a physical machine. And the D drive is coming from that physical machine directly and not from a storage area network, thereby reducing the latency reducing the amount of time that is required to read from your storage and write from your storage because it is coming directly from the host machine. So the disk with the best latency, which you could ever store data on, would always be the D drive. But unfortunately, you cannot store anything here which you would like to permanently keep. So the temp DB becomes a very good option. Our next advice, which I would like to most probably ask you to check on your machines is, how many cores is your machine having? It is a good practice to ensure that your number of data files, so if I go to the properties of tempdb and I look at the data files here, you'll notice I've got two data files. You can see file type is rows data. I've got two of them. Now, this is most probably with an assumption that I'm working on a machine that has two cores. Let me check that out for you. I'll go to more details. I'll go to performance. And if you look at the CPU here, you can see I've got two virtual CPUs. Now, because I've got two virtual CPUs, I've basically added two data files, both belonging to the same primary group in the tempdb, thereby ensuring that I'm able to basically split my data across multiple data files, thereby again improving performance. And uh, the recommendation here is to not exceed, the number of files should not exceed your number of cores so that you at least have one virtual thread dedicated to each read and write operation for each file that you're basically creating in the temp TV. So these are all small things, simple things, but they go a long way in, in terms of basically helping you improve performance and keep things going um, and, and make things better uh, in, in your overall system. So that's that's the best practice for tempdb. If there's any questions on tempdb at this stage, I would like to take it. Uh, if there's any clarification, if any of you want uh, any other questions answered, uh, please go ahead. I'm going to give you a minute for that before I basically move on to the next topic. Uh, someone did put in a message in the chat, so let me have a look at that. Okay, that was not visible. Yes, we can see. Okay. Okay, so most of you were trying to tell me you couldn't see the whiteboard, uh, which you could see later on. I don't see any more questions. I think you guys are good. Okay, I, th I think you guys are good, there, so I can more or less progress. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next topic, uh, which we are still going to basically talk about performance, and I'm still talking about it now uh, at the database level. I'm going to go and create a new whiteboard here. Let me check if I've still got my desktop shared. If I haven't, I'm going to share that and you should see the whiteboard crop up in a couple of seconds again. Got it. Now let's talk about the user databases because we're going to go one step at a time. So now we've basically spoken about a couple of things that you can do on the instance and that was the temp DB to improve performance. Now let's talk about the user database itself. Now whenever you create a database, let's say we'll call this DB1, it is always made up of files. At the end of the day, everything on an operating system is a file. You have to store data somewhere, and that somewhere is always going to be a file with some kind of formats. The minimum required to create a database is one data file, which is normally referred to as the primary data file, 
and one log file. This is the minimum requirement. Now the significance of this file called the primary data file is that the greatest innovation of relational databases was the segregation of data and metadata. This is what made the RDBMSs as popular as what they were are today, because you differentiated between the structure and the actual data. And doing this gave you the flexibility to be able to modify structures without basically worrying too much about the data getting corrupted or the data getting lost or the data structure getting destroyed. So the data stays intact, even if you change the metadata. So you can alter your table, add a column, and not worry about the data getting mismatched. You can look at your metadata and you can alter a table and remove a column not worrying about it affecting the data from the other columns. Now, this whole happened because of this huge, uh, maybe I should not use the word right now, but I'm going to say because you created this huge Chinese wall between the data and the metadata. And this is what basically made RDBMSs as popular as what they are today, because it gave us the flexibility of structure. Now, when we say the minimum requirement to create a database is a primary data file and a log file, the whole concept is, you cannot create objects in a database if you cannot store metadata. And what is metadata? Metadata is nothing but the structures, the definitions of the objects that store data. For example, if you're creating a table, the name of the table is metadata. The name of the columns in that table is metadata. The data types that you have on those columns is metadata. The constraints that you create on that table are metadata. The indexes that you create on them is metadata. I mean, the definition of the index is metadata. So all of this is metadata. You cannot create an object if you don't have a place to store metadata. And the significance of this primary file is it stores your metadata. Where does it store your metadata? It stores your metadata in a series of system tables, which is also referred to as the database catalog. A set of tables which stores your metadata uh, are called the database catalogs. All those tables together is referred to as the database catalog. Now, the significance of this word primary is that this particular file has these system tables. So all your metadata gets stored there. Now, here's a performance hint, which basically has been recommended for ages. I mean, this is not something which has been recommended in 2020. This has been recommended um, ever since I know databases, RDBMS, this is a recommendation is leave this file alone because your metadata is very frequently accessed, more frequently than you would like to imagine or acknowledge, but you cannot make any query on your tables, on your objects in your database without referencing the metadata tables. If you say select star from customers, you need to basically go and find the object ID of customers. You need to find the indexes that this customer table has. You need to understand the data types of those columns. All of this together after this, only then will you be able to think about accessing data for that table, which means every query you make, let it be insert, update, delete, select any query you make in simple, will have to reference a series of system tables before they are able to basically fetch you your data. So since these tables are so frequently used, leaving these tables in a dedicated file and leaving them alone will ensure you basically remove or uh, prevent uh, defragmentation to occur where these system and metadata tables are spread across your own chunk of data. It's more time consuming for your uh, uh, read head to basically go and locate this data on your disk uh, because you've got a lot of clutter there. So giving your system tables a dedicated file and not putting any of your user tables there would by far improve the overall performance of your queries. Every query will benefit from that, not a single query. So that's the best practice. And although I say this best practice is 20 years old, again, experience tells me when we do performance audits on systems, very often this is not basically something which has been done. It's a simple practice not too do, tough to go to uh, implement and i'll give you a small little demo now of how you can implement that from scratch when you're basically starting the setup itself okay so all you have to do is ensure that you have a secondary data file created which is called secondary files so you create data file two and this one you do not put into the primary group you don't make this primary you make this put this into another group and you ensure all your user tables goes into this file leaving your system 
tables uh, with the metadata on its own. So that's one of the best practices which um, I, I, I would tell you, which is again going to basically improve performance of your system. I'm going to show you how you can do that very quickly. I'm going to say new database right now. I'm going to name this database demo DB. And if this is visible to you guys, you will notice by default it has one data file called demo DB. And to ensure that you understand this, I'm going to call this demo DB meta data because I know now this is the primary file. This is the primary data file and it is going to now basically store all the system tables. I've got this right now on a disk called F. I'll leave that there. I'm going to add another data file. I'm going to call this demo db user data one. I can have many, but I'm going to use one right now. I'm going to call this user data one, and I'll ensure this is not in the primary group. Notice I cannot change this group for the first file. The first file has to be on primary. Here, I can drop down and create a new file group. So I'm going to create a new file group. I'm going to call it user data FG for user data file group. And I'm going to make this the default file group. Now, by doing this, every object you create without specifying a file group will by default go into user data FG. And by going into user data FG, it will go into this new file called demo DB user data one. In my case, this is also an F drive. But if I was a rich guy, I had enough money to spend. I would normally basically like to put this on a drive different from where the metadata is so that I truly benefit from the IOPS operation. So what I can do is assuming that I basically got that right now with me, I'm going to basically put this on the B drive. So I've got the user data going to the B drive. I've got the metadata stored on F drive and I've got the log stored in H drive. So that all in all together basically gives me, let me put B drive data there. Yes, makes more sense. So I've got B drive data which is on which I'm going to basically be putting my user tables. Uh, I've got F data or in which a file will get created to store my metadata, all my system tables. And I've got my log now basically on the H drive. Yes, if uh, you, uh, you, you don't have the budgets for multiple drives, uh, because these are not logical drives. These are actually physically connected drives, which I'm using right now. Uh, if, if you don't have enough budgets, no worries. You can basically use the same drive. Uh, but uh, keeping the file separate will still ensure that uh, you avoid the clutter. Uh, you keep these things together. Oh, demo DB already exists. I did this demo some other time. Uh, let's call this demo DB1. Okay. So I've just renamed that demo DB1 and I click here on OK. And now I basically got my system uh, created the way I want it to be. Now, if I create any object on this, so I'm going to go into the right click on this and say new query. And if I say create table X, column one integer, column two, whatever. Let's basically make this a chart 10. When I execute this command right now, I have not said which file group, but my default file group in demo db1 is user data. You see this has been selected as the default. So if I do not say, create table, table name. I do not use the word on file group. I do not say on which file group. I say on FG name. This is this is going to be the full syntax of a create table um, uh, where you do have the option of specifying which file group you want it on. If I do not specify that right now, it will go to the default file group. And like you just seen, the default file group is the user data FG, which means my data for the table X will get stored on the user data uh, file, which means it will leave the primary data file alone. However, important to understand when I execute this command, what really happens right now in the system is it does not really touch my user data file. It does not touch my uh, file, which is supposed to store data, uh, which is the user data file. It does not touch my user data one. It will only touch my metadata one because when you're using a DDL command, like a create table command, what you are actually doing is you are creating metadata. You are not creating data. So when I execute this, the only file that got affected right now was the metadata file, and uh, which means system tables got entries uh, because what you created just now was metadata. So if I do a select star from sys.objects, you will see an entry for the table called X. I can actually say where name 
is equal to x. And you will see this is a system table. And this table resides on your metadata file. And here you can see an entry got created for the table called x. In the same way, if I say select star from sys dot columns. where I cannot use the name anymore. So I'm going to say where ID is equal to, and I can basically copy paste this object underscore ID, which is here. This is the ID for the table X. Sorry. So the column is called object underscore ID. So where object underscore ID is equal to, I've just copy pasted the ID for the table called X here. Now if I execute this command, you will see that I get two rows here, column one and column two, which are the two columns that I created here. So you see sys columns is a system table, sys dot objects is a system table, and these system tables reside on our metadata file. So all of these entries and all the actions that happened with the create table was on the metadata file when I executed that command. However, when I say insert into x values, one comma whatever, maybe ABC, if I insert this, now the system goes to the metadata tables. He understands there's a table X. He understands that this table has two columns. It has a column called column one and a column called column two. It understands the data types of this after going to those metadata tables. And he also understands that the table X was created on the file group called user data FG. And he knows the user data FG now has only one file on it called the user data file which means the data for this table X now, this one ABC will actually get stored on the user data file. Now this will ensure that you've got a pretty decent segregation of your uh, uh, metadata and your data. And this will help you improve performance by ensuring that almost every query, not almost all your queries touch your system tables, your metadata tables. Uh, there is locking, there is blocking. When you keep altering objects, creating objects, there's, there's a lot of locks that are needed even on the system tables. Uh, normally, when you see, uh, when you're, when you're uh, doing a monitoring session and you see something called a spin lock being created, Okay, the spin lock usually is a lightweight lock which are created on uh, system tables. And sometimes that could cause you uh, latency, that could cause you uh, problems in your query. Uh, it could uh, cause you slowness in your query because the activity on your metadata tables is simply too plenty. And this goes back again to what I started with today. Uh, try and avoid creating too many objects because if you're creating too many objects, again, you're creating contention on the system tables. Uh, remember the way an RDBMS was originally designed was that you create objects and you basically manipulate data in those objects. Uh, it was not really created and designed for you to be dynamically creating objects. So if you have aggressive uh, uh, programs which are basically trying to create tables, alter tables, drop tables all the time, you are most probably going to be see a, seeing a lot of contention on the system tables and uh, you're, you're going to see uh, performance deterioration. Uh, from the programmer perspective and the developer perspective, the uh, recommendation would be uh, be conscious of this. Uh, try not to create objects unnecessarily. Create them only if they are required. And as we progress through the remaining parts of the sessions, I will give you other ways of mitigating this uh, in case you are forced to basically create objects dynamically and plenty of objects dynamically. There are hundreds of temp tables being created every second on your systems, and there are hundreds of them also being dropped. Uh, we can basically look at ways to mitigate that, uh, but uh, those would be more of the administration activity than a developer activity. Uh, but uh, but we can see how we can basically handle those kind of scenarios. Uh, so with uh, that today, I would bring today's session to a close in terms of the topics. Uh, and uh, tomorrow we'll continue with this. We'll start going into uh, understanding individual queries and uh, or we'll try our best to basically ensure that by the end of all the practices and uh, that, that we have in this series, so you, you'll understand queries as well and be able to optimize them well. Uh, any questions on today's session? Like always, uh, it's open to the room right now. Uh, so please go ahead and shoot the questions and I'll be happy to take them. No questions? Okay. So cheers, guys. Have a very good evening. Okay. And I'll see you guys tomorrow, same time, uh, 5 30 for another 30 minutes of uh, SQL optimization. Uh, thanks a lot for attending. Hope you enjoyed the session. See you guys again tomorrow. Bye bye.